you know, started to live for him. And here I am today, thanks be to God. So I grew up, you know, seeking the Lord, loving the Lord, being active in church, you know, being on fire for God, still am. But at the time, you know, when I was in Jamaica, I, how God was introduced to me, you know, I'm really grateful for my foundation and everything that I learned, you know, back in my home church and all the other churches that I've been a part of. But there were certain, there was a way that, you know, God was intro- introduced to me and the things of God were introduced to me. And, you know, it, it left me in a very hard place. As Sister Monica was, Dr. Monica was saying about um, Sister Melissa yesterday when she was saying, you know, some of the things that were taught in church, it was hard for her to receive them. But for me, I did receive them. But as I got older, I realized that these things that I that were taught to me, you know, I was coming up on some struggles. So just to give an example, I, I was more legalistic than I was, you know, I didn't understand the concept of grace and the fact that we're no longer under the law and now we're under grace. And I didn't understand you know, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us, you know, I was more so concerned about how long my skirt was, and no, 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 no offense to anyone who wears long, long clothes, I still wear long clothes sometimes, but, you know, it's like I was trained to look more on the external man than the internal man, and so I was very active in church, very anointed and everything, you know, praying, I was always at every Bible study, at every church service. I dress modestly, still do. Um, and so it's like my salvation was based off works and what I can do for God and not necessarily what he did for me. Um, I did struggle with condemnation a lot in those days, especially, especially when I migrated. I realized that I was really struggling with condemnation because it's like a thing with persons who have a legalistic mindset in the body of Christ is that you find those people struggling with condemnation a lot because they say, okay, so this week I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm reading the word. It's like a given day will come and you don't do it. You don't do that. You probably missed your, your prayer time or you missed Bible study and then you feel bad and you feel like, oh, I'm not close to God today. And so it's like, we feel like we have to work, 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 work. We have to do all these external things to be accepted by God. And so I struggled with that when I migrated because I was getting older now. And I'm finding that, you know, this that was presented to me as, you know, as a teenager, it's it's not working anymore. And I find that, you know, I started to read the Bible for myself and I realized like, you know, what was ta- some of what, not everything, some of what was taught to me wasn't really consistent with what the word of God or with what God was explaining to me and teaching me through reading the word. So as I said, my salvation at the time was based on works and the external man, I mean, making sure I look the part, making sure, you know, I'm doing the do and walking the walk with my intern. I was struggling on the inside with so many different things. You know, I struggled with condemnation. I struggled with sexual sins. Now, I was fornicating, but there are so many other sexual sins out there, you know, like pornography. Just to be transparent, I did struggle with those things, um, even while being very active in church. You know, I love the Lord, but I was still struggling. And I remember even struggling with stuff like that. I would always pray and ask the Lord to deliver me. Like, I never stopped praying. So anyways, I migrated. And obviously, the Lord delivered me from those things. He delivered me from sexual perversion, sexual sins. He definitely delivered me from those things. Thanks be to God. That's a different story from another time. Um, I judged my holiness based off my works and how I looked. So, as I said, these were some of the, it was just the way it was presented at the time. And it's still being presented that way, unfortunately, in many other churches across the world where people feel like they need to judge their holiness based off what they are doing for God and not necessarily what God has done for them. You know, I was anointed, but born by sin, struggling with sins and bad habits. You know, as I said earlier, I was focused more on my attire, making sure my skirt was, you know, past my knee. And as I said, I still do just modestly. I believe in modesty and I'm not knocking anyone who wears skirts and, you know, that kind of thing because I still wear my skirts too. But um, I was just more focused. I was taught and trained to pay more attention to those things than the transformation of the inner man. So I was doing church being active in ministry, but I did not know who I was as a daughter of God. And I looked at the definition of daughter 
Um, and it means acceptable to God, rejoicing in God's peculiar care and protection. I love to look up the definitions. You know, it gives the meaning of things more <laughs> meaning. So um, I migrated and I realized, you know, as I said, what was taught to me as a child, it was no longer working. Because obviously I'm growing and I'm learning to, you know, seek God for myself, reading the word. I'm like, okay, you know, then I, I and when I migrated, that's when I had to do a lot of unlearning. And it was very hard. It was very, very hard because I'm literally, um, you know, I don't want to say destroying, but I'm basically debunking a lot of things that that's the foundation of my life. You know, it was very hard. It's very hard to let go of something that you've known, you know, how to do for years to relearn something else. It was very, very, very hard. But those moments really pushed me, you know, to see God more and more. So I found that I was struggling in my faith. Yes, I still love the Lord. I really do, really did at the time, but I was still struggling with certain things. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 to 24, he spoke we see where the Apostle Paul was going through. Well, he was explaining a frustration that he was experiencing where he said, you know, when I want to do right, he is present me, present with me, sorry. And he said, who's going to save me from this wretched body that I'm in? You know, I want to do right, but I find that I'm doing the opposite. So he found that his flesh was in conflict with the spirit. And so I found myself in the same place, experiencing the same frustration that Paul spoke about in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 to 24. And I can read it brief, just a part of it. And if you want to follow along, you can. Romans chapter 7, verse 21 to 24. I'm going to read it in the ESV version. It's, close, it's very close to the King James. So that's Romans 7, verse 21 to 24. It says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then in, in verse 25, we see where he got a revelation. So he said, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind or with my flesh. I serve the law of sin. And in chapter eight, we see where he got a breakthrough. He got a revelation. He got an understanding, you know, how to get out of this frustration. So I found myself in the same place. I'm like, OK, um, they say that Jesus died for me on the cross. I believe that. But why is it that, and they said that Jesus conquered death, death, hell, and the grave, and he conquered sin and the power of sin. So I found myself in a place, I was like, okay, why do I feel like I'm still a slave to sin? If Jesus said that, you know, we are dead to sin, and the, you, you know, there are scriptures in, in like in Colossians that says, I am dead and my life is hidden in Christ with God. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who live in me and we are dead to the law, we are dead to the power of sin. You see scriptures like this in like Romans and, you know, in the New Testament that shows us the advantage that we have through Christ. And this wasn't really taught to me you know back then and so when I came upon this frustration I was like okay what I was taught is not really helping me right now because I feel like I'm a slave to sin I feel like you know my flesh is winning this war against me even though the bible says through Christ we overcome the world and everything that's in the world and we overcome the flesh and that kind of thing I remember there was a time I used to pray a lot like lord make me righteous make me righteous and I believe many of us we have prayed that prayer there persons who still are praying that prayer lord make me righteous make me righteous and i generally used to pray like i really meant it like god make me righteous jesus and i remember i spoke to a friend and she said trish um she was in the same place that i was in and she said trish the bible says that we are the righteousness of god and when she told me that i literally felt like somebody pulled me out of a deep dark hole because i did not know that all my years of being in church, I did not know that we, if you are now a child of God, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit, baptized in his name, you are now the righteousness of God because of Christ Jesus, not because of anything you do or will ever do, but it's all about what he has done for you. And when she told me that, I literally broke down and I started to cry because I did not know this. All my years of being in church, you know, I've been working to 
be righteous before God, not knowing that I've already been made righteous God through the work of Jesus Christ. And so this was, this moment was the beginning of, you know, my liberation in my salvation, knowing the truth about my identity in God, knowing that I don't have to, it's not about what I do for God, but it's about what he has done for me and my works, anything that I do, of course, we're active in ministry. We do things for God. We do good works. We should do it out of a place of gratitude, right? So we're not doing it to be saved. We're doing it, we're doing it because we are already, sorry, we're not doing it to be made righteous. We're doing it because we are righteous, right? So it's like a lot of persons, their salvation is based off work. They think that the longer their skirt is, the, the holier they are. And I used to think that way too. But that, that's not what the Bible teaches, right? Dress the way you want to just because you want to give glory to God, but not because you want to be made right with God. We are made right with God because of what Jesus did on the cross. So when I found that out, and it's also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, going to read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that's, that's, that's one of the scriptures that speaks about us being the righteousness of God and how. And you know, the scripture said Jesus became sin so that we might become righteous. So he died in our place so that we may take his place. He became poor so that we might become rich. So if there's anybody on here and you're struggling in your salvation, you feel like, you know, the, the, you feel like, and, he, and sometimes it's not even a matter of attire. Sometimes it's a matter of even praying. Some people think the, the more they pray is the holier they're going to be. That, that, that mindset isn't necessarily consistent with the word of God. Right, we shouldn't pray because we want to be holy. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are baptized in His name, you are filled with His Holy Spirit, you are made right with God. It's not about what you can do or what you will ever do. It's about what Jesus has done for us. So that that situation right there, when my when my friend told me of that scripture and told me that that I am the righteousness of God because of Christ Jesus, it was almost like a deliverance took place. And lately, recently, I found a, a scripture that I really love, and it's Proverbs 11, verse 9. The second part, it says, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. I really love this scripture. I, it, it, the Lord brought it to my attention recently because, and it, it just explains a lot of things, you know, that I see happening in the body of Christ in my life as well. Proverbs 11, verse 9, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. So that tells us that the just, needs deliverance christian people need deliverance and you know in the in the church culture we know that deliverance takes place when persons you know they you know you see persons getting prayed for and they have like a a, 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 a rubbish bin and you know persons are like throwing up and you know so that's that's one part of deliverance that we see happen often in church where persons are getting deli- persons are getting delivered from spirits and they throw up or they scream so you know that a demonic presence is leaving this person's life. But that's like, I was talking with a friend last night. I was talking with a friend last night and he was saying, you know, that's like 5% of the work that you need to do. And the other 95% is you getting into the word of God and getting knowledge. I once again, Proverbs 11 says, Proverbs 11 verse 9 says, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. And then there's a scripture in Hosea, Hosea, Hosea 4 verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. So the scripture in Proverbs 11 verse 9 tells us that we need to go through a deliverance. And that deliverance takes place by us getting knowledge, knowledge from the word. So I realized that many things that we struggle with in our Christian walk, it's as a result of ignorance. We are ignorant of who God is. We are ignorant of who we are in him. We're ignorant of his word. And so the reason why we, one of the reasons why we struggle in life is because there is something that we don't know. There's something that the Lord taught me. He said, anytime you come upon a problem in your life, whether it's mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, any aspect of your life, you come upon a problem and you don't know what to do. And you know, you find that it's hard. It's as a result of something that you don't know. So what then? You need revelation. You need more revelation. Right. So right there, the process of really knowing my identity in God, that's where it really began. You know, um, the Lord started to address 
certain things like childhood trauma, allowing the Lord to father me, you know, whatever wounds I got as a child. And I spoke about it the last, I think it was the last time I came on here about um, childhood trauma. Um, my parents, they are divorced and how, and I spoke about how that affected me as a young girl growing up. And so there's so many things. So when you, the fact, so the thing is this, just to give a little backstory, um, we live in a fallen world. We have our parents and our parents, they do the best they can. And some, some children, unfortunately, they did not get the full, um, nurture and love that they needed as a child to develop properly they didn't get that unfortunately are we saying that our parents were bad no they the bottom line is that we live in a fallen world so everybody is messed up every single person is messed up and they're doing the best they can so my parents they did the best they could by the end of the day I still grew up lacking in certain areas in my life like emotionally I grew up with identity problems did my parents love love me they definitely did but it's like be, be like, like so let's say my dad I grew up without my dad I only saw him like on holidays so as a teenage girl you know I grew up looking for love so if a guy comes to me back then I say hey you know you're really beautiful you know it would fill up in my head and I feel very good very good about myself not that I was an easy girl but you know you know it makes you feel good about yourself and so it makes you run after things and seek things and sometimes some persons because the wound is so severe, they end up in, in things like prostitution. They end up doing things that really, really, really degrades their worth because they don't understand who they are. They don't know what love is. And so they grow up looking for it. And so those are some of the things I had to heal from, you know, low self-esteem, low self-confidence, you know, low self-love and that kind of thing. The Lord really healed me from those things. So just to give a backstory on that, and I had to allow the Lord to father me. You know, because obviously I can't go back in my past and relive that because the damage is already done. So what? No, forgive my parents and understand that they were doing the best that they could. So wherever they lacked, God will now step in and, you know, fill that 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 void. So what I'm learning now, I'm and I think I'm going to anytime I'm asked to speak on any platform, this will always be um like the main objective. And it's. It is being transformed into the image of Christ. That, that's the objective of my life. And if I'm ever speaking to anyone, whether in public or in private, that's always going to be like the focus topic to be transformed into the image of Christ. That's what I'm learning about now. That's what God is, God, that's what God has me focusing on right now. And I realize that the whole point, the whole essence of this Christian journey, this life, is all about being transformed into the image of God. So also, it's also about becoming like Jesus in terms of having his character and his likeness. So we talk about being transformed into the image of Christ. What is the image of Christ? The image of Christ is love. The Bible says God is love. And what is love? We see the description of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. And these, all these, these character traits are character traits that we see in God. God is patient with us. He's kind with us. You know, he never gives up. He always believes, you know, that kind of thing. We see love demonstrated, um, St. John 3, verse 16. God, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know, so this whole Christian life, it's not just about, you know, it's about miracles, it's about signs, it's about wonders, it's about God helping you to get that job, it's about God delivering you from sin, it's about all those things, but it's also about becoming, being transformed into the image of Christ, and the image of Christ is love. What is love? We see love being explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 7. I'm also looking more into dying to self and what it really means. You know, growing up in church, I've always heard it, I've always heard it. You need to die to self. You need to die to self. And to be very honest, I sometimes I didn't like to hear it because I'm like, what does that mean? Does that mean I can't wear my favorite shirt? Does that mean I can't, you know, listen to my favorite song? I like there's there's a genre of gospel music that's called Afrobeat gospel. It's like upbeat. It's like African vibe, but it's gospel music. I really love upbeat music, but it's gospel, right? So does that mean I can't listen to you know <laughs> Afro gospel? Does that mean I can't? eat my favorite ice cream, okay, wear my favorite shirt. What does dying to self mean? Does it mean, you know, I can't hang out with my friends? What does dying to self mean? And I started to look into it. 
And the Lord started to really open my understanding as to what it means to die to self. And I just feel like there's so many things that we struggle with in the body of Christ. And it's because of, you know, lack of understanding. As the scripture says, to knowledge shall it just be delivered. And once we get knowledge and understanding, you know, you realize that this thing is really not that hard. That's why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's why he said, you know, all you're getting, get understanding. Because when we understand what it's really about, you know, it just becomes a bit easier. Not that this, whole, not that this thing is going to be easy all the way. All the way. as you understand more and more the revelations and the insight of God, you find that, you know, it's not that difficult. Give me a second. Sorry. So... I mentioned what does dying to self mean? We're not just dying to self, we're dying to live, right? Because the Bible says, I am dead. So what is dead? The parts of you that does not look like Christ. When he says die to self, deny yourself, it's the parts of you that does not look like Christ. It's the Adamic nature in you. Give me a second. Give me a second. Yeah, so... Okay, so when the Bible speaks about dying to self, it's telling us that we need to die to the Adamic nature. What is the Adamic nature? So we know that when Adam was created at first, he was perfect. He didn't have any sin, any flaw. He was perfect, both him and Eve. But when they fell, people speak about now the Adamic nature. The Adamic nature is the part, is the sinful nature of Adam, rather. You know, when sin entered Adam, when sin entered the world, it's like he became the opposite of who he was, right? So we were all, so Adam represented the whole human race. Adam represented every man that would ever live and he represented every woman that would ever live. But the Bible says that Jesus is the second Adam. So no, we should mimic and we should be like Jesus because he's the second Adam, right? So when the Bible says die to self, it means to die to the Adamic nature. That's your nature. So example, nobody taught you to be angry we did not go to school to learn to be angry nobody taught us how to be jealous nobody taught us how to get envious nobody taught us how to get upset and have rage nobody taught us how to you know lust nobody taught us those things we were just born unfortunately with those traits in us and so all these things all these bad things that the bible speaks against this is our Adamic nature, and these are the parts of us that we need to die to. So dying to self doesn't mean you can't wear your favorite T-shirt. It doesn't mean you can't wear your favorite hairstyle. Of course, doing all things with modesty and moderation. But it doesn't mean you can't be your unique self, because God gave us a unique personality, right? Some persons, they're introverts. Some persons are ambiverts. I'm an ambivert. According to psychology, I can be introverted at times and I can also be extroverted. I can be very reserved at times and I can also be very outgoing. You know, some persons, they, I like upbeat music. I, you know, I like my alone time. You know, this is just my unique personality. I love to sing. I love to laugh. I absolutely love to laugh. I love jokes, clean jokes. I love to laugh. I love a good laugh. So that's my unique personality. So when it says die to self, it's not saying you can't be your unique self because God gave us our personality. And that part is just you. You know, there's, you know, so the parts of you that need to die is the Adamic you, the parts of you that does not look like Christ. The anger, the Bible talks about it. Anger, lust, um, um, evil thoughts, malicious thoughts, um, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, die to those things, jealousy, envy, malice, and, you know, anger and pride, die to those things that does not look like Christ. So in other words, if you look at the person of Jesus and you cannot find these character traits in, in them, that means you should not have them. And so you should die to them, right? So in... Luke 9, 23 and 24. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Twenty-three, And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So the same, the same thing about denying yourself, dying to self is almost the same thing. And I looked up the word deny. Deny means to reject. You are proclaiming that this thing is not true. And 
one of the things I'm learning, I hope I can explain it properly. When it says to deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself, meaning you should den deny the Adamic nature in you. Because that's what we inherited from Adam. That's why the Bible says we were born and shaped in, and in sin and in, in, in iniquity because we inherited this from Adam. And then those of us now who are in Christ, we inherited the righteousness of God. So if we inherited the righteousness of Jesus Christ, being that the Bible says he's the second Adam, then why are we still, you know, walking in the nature of Adam, right? And so this is just something that I've, I've started to really look into and the Lord has um, started to teach me on. When it says to deny yourself, it means to reject the old you, reject it, deny it refuse it resist it so this is one of the things that you can use when you have an understanding of this it can help you to fight those internal thoughts sometimes you're in church let's talk about it sometimes you're in church and that evil thought just crossing your mind and you're like come on come on come on and sometimes you're not even thinking about anything rude you're not even thinking about anything you know ungodly something just cr you're you're just there worshiping or whatever is happening in church and a thought just cross your mind how do you deal with thoughts like that you know, sometimes, so let's, let's be, let's be honest here. Sometimes, you know, somebody might be doing something. Somebody might be singing a song and I can relate where somebody goes up to sing. And I, in my head, I'm like, I might not be saying it out loud. I'm just being honest because I'm sure everybody on here can relate. Somebody might go up to sing a song and in my head, I'm like, oh, I can sing better than her. I can sing better than her. And then, you know, as you grow in God, you know, you're not supposed to have thoughts like that because that's rooted in, that's rooted in pride and you know, a little ego there, and that's not of God. And so we're not supposed to have thoughts like this. And so how do you counteract thoughts like this? Sometimes you see somebody with something that you want, you find, you feel yourself getting jealous of it. So in the Bible it says, deny yourself. You should deny it. So every time you feel yourself getting jealous, getting prideful, feeling like you're better than somebody else, you need to speak out of your mouth and say, this is not who I am. I am dead to that. Jealousy is not who I am because the Bible says we are a new creation. So yes, you ask Lord to forgive you, but you should also deny it. Deny means to reject it. You say, listen, it's not true. You can look it up and you'll find some of the synonyms for deny. It will say, you know, to, to, um, to, do, to reject something. You, you, you claim it to not be true. Somebody come to you and say, um, you stole my money. You deny it. I say, that's not true. That's not true. So anytime the enemy wants you to make you feel like you're jealous of somebody, you say, no, 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 no. That's not who I am. And you renew your mind with the word of God. But if you truly, if you give into it, the Bible says, yield not to temptation for healing is sin. So if you give into that jealousy and that feeling of jealousy, and then out of, out of yielding to that jealousy, it's obviously going to come out in your, in your speech. So you say things like, well, um, you know, you know, you know, people make statements sometimes and you can tell that it's rooted in jealousy and envy and malice and all these evil things. So, but every time you have an intrusive thought, whether it's jealousy, you know, pride, it's rooted in, in lust or anything of that nature, you should deny it and rebuke it also. The Bible says to bring into captivity every thought that goes against the knowledge of God. So you are now a new creation in Christ. You're a new being. That's what the Bible says. We are new creation. We are sons of God. We are made right with God because of Christ Jesus. So how is it that the enemy wants to put these evil thoughts in my head? And I am dead to these things. The Bible says I am dead in Colossians 3 verse 3. I am dead and my life is hidden in God with Christ. So why is it that these, these thoughts are coming up? So every time they come up, you need to reject it. You need to deny it. Deny it. Sorry about that. We need to deny these thoughts and say, this is not who I am. I am a new creation in Christ and we have to renew our mind with the word of God. So I hope that was clear, right? So your true self is like Christ. So when people preach, you should die to self. They should also preach, you must die to the Adamic nature so that you can become the real you. And the real you is in Christ. The real you is like Christ in terms of when the Bible speaks about the fruits of the spirit. So once again, I said, you can keep your unique personality. If you're a joyful and a bubbly person, you're a social butterfly, that's just you. Then there's some persons, they just love to be alone. They'll come out here and there when they need to. That's just you. Some persons, you know, they love the color blue. They like vanilla ice cream. And that's just your unique 
personality. You can keep that part because that's you. That's God's gift to you, your unique personality. But the part of you that does not look like Christ, that's the part of us that we're supposed to die to. So Galatians 5, let's find it. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. Galatians chapter 5. So let's start from verse 19. It speaks about the works of the flesh. So these are the parts of us that we need to die to. Sexual, the Galatians 5 verse 19. Galatians 5 verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Amen. So as we grow in our walk with God, we're supposed to look more and more like Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. The fruit of the spirit is supposed to be seen. We're supposed to be more patient. We're supposed to be more gentle, more faithful. We're supposed to have more self-control, right? So we must be changed. And once again, what the Lord has me focusing on is about being transformed into the image of Christ. This whole Christian thing is not about how often you go to church. It's not about how much tongues you speak in. I speak in tongues a lot. I love speaking in tongues because it's powerful. And the Bible says it's an advantage that we have. You know, build up your most holy faith by praying in the spirit. Praying in tongues is powerful. But this whole Christian thing is not about how often you go to church. It's not about how often you pray in tongues. It's not about how long your skirt is. It's not about any of these things that people have made it about. It's about being transformed into the image of Christ, making sure that my inner man is being renewed day by day. And so I grow to look more and more like Christ. So our lives must be changed and our mindset must be changed back to the original state right so it's all about becoming the person that god created you to be with your unique personality and also also you walking in the likeness and the image of christ right and the image of christ is love the fruits of the spirit love patience joy peace and all these things we have to look more and more like what the scripture speaks about here so we were made in the image of God and in the likeness of God. So we are image bearers. We as Christians who have received the Holy Spirit, baptized in Jesus' name, we are image bearers of God, right? Colossians 3 verse 10 says, For you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. I'll read this again. Colossians 3 verse 10. For you have acquired new creation. We are a new creation. We have acquired a new life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. So that means we have received a new life. And as we are growing in God, we're supposed to be renewed and we're supposed to be changing into the likeness of the one that created you. So as I said, as we grow more and more, we're supposed to be looking more and more like Christ. <laughs> Oh my, something just came to me. Something just crossed my mind. Wow, what I will say. But I want to give this testimony. Um, I used to bite my fingernails a lot, like really bad. Ever since I had teeth, I used to bite my nails up until a month ago. And it was inherited from my mom. She doesn't bite her nails anymore, though. Thanks be to God. But I used to bite my nails really bad. Like they were like, these are my nails now. And it was like really low. I made a YouTube video about it on my YouTube channel. So, and I showed pictures of how my nails looked for all my life. And um, we, obviously I received salvation, right? That's according to what was taught in church that we, we think that salvation has to do with you baptizing in Jesus name and you receiving the Holy Ghost. That's a part of it. But I believe that salvation, if you say you've received salvation, it's supposed to show in every aspect of your life. It's supposed to show in every aspect of your life. I looked at what, the, what salvation means. Um, and salvation means deliverance. It means welfare, prosperity, and victory. But the key word is um, deliverance. 
So, as I said, every part of us must experience the salvation of the Lord. So, of course, nail biting is not a hell or heaven issue. It's just a bad habit that I had. Give me like, give me one minute. My phone is dying. Just one minute. Why? Oh, if you have any questions, I was on mute and talking. You can put your questions in the chat or you could raise your hands at the end and then she will be um answer you as you can see she's growing and she's learning and some of the things that she's saying that we can identify with that when you serve God more, you, you think, think that then you are going to get a greater reward because you're just doing everything that God asks of you, not out of love, but because you think that you're trying to secure your salvation or to be made righteous when we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And this just tie in to what Melissa was saying yesterday, that when you know who you are, everything else will fall in place. All right, back to you, Trishana. Amen. So I was talking about um, my struggle of nail biting. It was really bad. Sometimes I'd bite my nails till they bleed to the point where um, even to take a shower, I sometimes have to put on a gloves because obviously I bite like the flesh, so it's the flesh is ripped off. So, you know, if water or soap touches it, it's going to burn. So sometimes take a shower to even wash the dishes. I have to put on gloves because of how badly I bit my nails. And I, it's something I prayed about just casually, like, Lord, help me to stop biting my nails and, you know, that kind of thing. And it was about three or four months ago, I was biting my fingernails and this finger, this, this index finger here, I literally bit off all the nail. And if I could show the picture right now, I would. But I don't think I'm able to because, yeah. But I, I should have arranged that first. But I made a video on my YouTube channel on how my fingernails looked for many years. But a couple months ago, this index finger, was the, the nail was completely gone. I literally bit it off until there was like a black... You know, it was just really looking very ugly. Very, very ugly. And that was when I realized, listen... This is not normal. There is, um, there is, and this is when I started to ask the Lord, like, God, is there a demonic? Is this demonic? You know, is me biting my nails demonic? Is there a demonic presence? You know, a demonic spirit that's causing me to bite my nails? The Bible says the devil comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. And if there is any way he can get you to destroy yourself whether it's your physical body your mind or your emotions he's gonna do it if there's any way he can get to destroy yourself he's gonna do it so some persons they destroy themselves by the negative thinking they destroy themselves some persons who are suicidal, all day you would see razor marks on their hand you know any way the enemy can get you to destroy yourself to kill yourself whether it's by whether it's slowly but if there's a way he can get you to destroy yourself, he's going to do it. And so for me, one of the ways he was getting me to destroy my physical body was by eating my fingers. And I said, listen, this is when I started to question, like, this is not, this is not normal. How is it that I find pleasure in eating my flesh? And I'm getting older, like I'm a young lady, I want to look presentable. I'm like, there's no way it's normal that I find pleasure. I literally enjoyed it. There's no way I, I, it's normal that I find pleasure in eating my fingers away like it's nobody's business. And that's when I started to seek God, like, God, is there, a, is there a demonic presence in my life? And you might say, how can a Christian have a demon? I didn't necessarily have a demon possessing me, but rather it was oppressing me, influencing me to bite my nails, you know? And I started to seek God about it. And I prayed, I remember I was watching the Lord led me to this video on YouTube where this guy, he was talking about, you know, how you can spot a demon in somebody, whether it's yourself or somebody that you know. And he started to list out, you know, a number of ways you can find, you know, spot a demon in somebody's life. And he started to list out uh, about 14 ways and about three of them I could identify with. Um, it was nail biting. I had a fear of dogs and fear of other, you know, little things like fear of dogs. I've been bitten before um, and also lip biting. So I bite my lips as well. And so at the end of the video, he started to pray and 
to be very honest, um, I was just ready to be delivered, man, because I'm like, you know, it's there's no way this is normal. And so, of course, psychologists, they link nail biting to anxiety. You know, it's a coping mechanism. I'm aware of that. And even on that time, I was really struggling with anxiety, where to the point where my head top and my neck back is almost like it was on fire. And if you know, our nervous system is like located in our heads and specifically at the back. So whenever you start to feel that it's like a burning sensation in the in the neck back of your head or in your head top, you, my friend, you're struggling with anxiety. And what, what needs to happen, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to regulate your nervous system. Psychologists speak about it as, as, as well, where they say your nervous system needs to be regulated. And sometimes many of us, a lot of people, even in the body of Christ, they're still in survival mode, meaning they have our bodies, Throughout our lifetime, we have all experienced trauma in one way, shape, or form. It can be emotional trauma, mental trauma, physical, sexual trauma. You know, we've been through things as, you know, human beings in our lives. And many of us, we we have done a good job with pushing these things to the side, pushing them under the rug, and not dealing with them. So guess what? That trauma is still stored in your body. And so this is one of the reasons why people get sick. One of the reasons why people get sick, because... But even in Proverbs, Proverbs speaks about it. It says, jealousy and envy is like cancer, which eats away your bone. The Bible says a cheerful heart is like medicine to the body. So you find that somebody who has unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, jealousy, it's literally like cancer. And it's no, seriously, like, seriously, it's literally killing you. It's literally killing you. So whatever, it's like these these, these negative emotions will now find expression in our bodies. So you find that some people, their hair start falling out. They have, you know, kidney problems, liver problems. You know, it's all as a result of the emotions, the trauma that is stuck and trapped in our body. So that's why I said many persons, they're living in survival mode. So guess what? I'll give you an example, which is what I said a while ago. Survival mode can look like, I have trauma that I did not allow the Lord to heal. So that trauma, that those negative emotions, anxiety and, you know, rejection and, you know, fear of rejection, it's still stuck in my body. It's still in my body. So I am in survival mode. So if, in a, if, if example, if I'm, if in my, oh my God, I'm talking so fast. <laughs> talking so fast because I'm so passionate about this. But if I'm in a situation where I feel as if I might get rejected, it's like my instant, um, what I will resort to is biting my nails. If I'm in a situation where I'm anxious, sorry, sorry about that. If I'm in a situation where I'm anxious, I just resort to biting my nails. So it's like, it starts on the inside. Nobody just gets up and gets sick like that. It all starts from the inside. And I'll get into that some more. So I hope I'm making sense. So when you find that you let go of this trauma, you allow the Lord to heal your heart from these negative emotions, you find that your body will do better. There's so many, there's so many ways we can get healing as children of God. First of all, the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. But Proverbs also give you a lot of ways, and not just Proverbs, but so many scriptures in the Bible that gives you a solution as to how you can get healing in your body. Right? So, nail biting, I watched the video and um I started to, you know, throw up and that kind of thing. I believe that that the de that demonic presence that was causing me to, to bite my nails to the point and your case if you bite your nails your case may not be demonic I'm not saying that but my case it definitely was because as I said I completely bit off the nail off this finger all the way off so that was when I knew listen I have company there's something else here so your case may not be demonic but you never know check it out check it out this world is very spiritual. This world is very spiritual. So long story short, the Lord delivered me from nail biting and these are my nails today. And to, it's, it's still a miracle to be very honest. And it's still something, whenever I look on them, I just burst out in praise because it's like I have a whole new set of hands, you know? <laughs> it's it's really a really huge testimony for me. So obviously, as I said, nail biting is not a hell or heaven situation. Some of us, we have bad habits. Some people, they, they sit on every day and pick out them ear. You know it's not a hell or heaven situation, but it's something that's destroying you. You're, you're destroying your appearance and eventually that's going to affect you. 
you know, if you have low self-esteem, you you curse, you have sexual perversion, you struggle with lust and gossiping and complaining, depression, anger and rage and all mindsets and just generally bad habits and sins, all of these things, they have, they have to change and they can change. But how are they going to change if you don't have knowledge? The Bible says, again, Proverbs 11 verse 9, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. It's not just prayer. And I'm all for, you know, as I said, in the church culture, we've seen persons come up to the altar where they're getting deliverance and they might throw up in a trash can. They scream out because a demon is leaving them. They pass feces and that kind of thing. There's so many ways that, you know, when a demonic presence is leaving somebody's life, the person will like, you know, manifest in different ways but after leaving a deliverance service in church listen majority of your of your deliverance is dependent on you getting knowledge so first talk about maintaining your deliverance how do you maintain your deliverance you, you shouldn't just maintain your deliverance you should um upgrade your deliverance by getting into the word of god and getting understanding and revelation about what the word of god says so deliverance comes through knowledge as again, once again, the scripture, my, one of my favorite scriptures, Proverbs 11, verse 9. Through knowledge shall the just be delivered. So this tells us that Christian people need deliverance. Many of us, we have sicknesses. We have struggles in the flesh. How are we going to get deliverance? It's through knowledge. And it's not just merely reading the word because you can read the word. It's the same way people can quote, by his stripes, I am healed. And they're still sick. And, you know, I'm not like trying to make anybody feel bad, not trying to be insensitive, but it's just something I'm looking into. Like, man, if this, if Jesus said we're here, why are we seeing people getting healed? Like, you know, I'm, I, just, I just, you know, if Jesus gave us all of these benefits, why, why isn't it working? Somebody has it wrong and it's not the word of God, it's us. It's not the word of God. Why people quote, by his stripes, I am healed. I am the head and not the tail. You know, I am above and not beneath. I yes still. We're still in the position that we're in five years ago, 10 years ago. We're still struggling with the same things. So that means it's not merely knowing the scriptures, but it's, also, it's, it's about getting a revelation of the scriptures. And I'll give an example shortly. So let me give you an example right now, right there. So let's say you have a fruit. This is, this, this is a bottle of water, right? This, is, this would be considered food. I guess, right? And so this water represents the word of God, right? We have the water in our hands. Somebody say, I'm thirsty. And they give you the water. So somebody say, I need God, I need help. And they give you a Bible. You have to know, open the water, open the Bible. You have to drink it, read the word. But it's not just about reading the word. You have to, let me give a better example. I don't want to use the water, sorry. Let me use an, let me use an orange. So imagine an orange, right? You say you need food, you're hungry, and somebody just happens to have an orange, and they give you the orange, and the orange will represent the word of God, right? Somebody gives you a Bible. But you have the food in your hand, you have the orange in your hand, but the way for you to get the nutrients and the juice and, you know, the, the niceness of the orange, you have to cut it open. So... When we cut open the orange, that's when we get the juice and the benefits from it. So it's the same thing with the word of God. Many of us, we quote the scriptures, but we don't have a revelation behind the scriptures. Meaning it's like the scriptures, it's like God, you're reading the scriptures without the Holy Spirit giving you understanding. Hence why we have so many divisions in the body of Christ today, because persons have read the scriptures without being guided by the Holy Spirit. So they just have a surface understanding of what the scripture is saying. They don't have a revelation from God about what the scriptures you're talking about. They don't have context, right? And it's very important that we study the word of God with the Holy Spirit. How can you read a book without having the mind of the author? You know, and it's, it's you know, one of the dangerous things to me is that so many people, we can read the scriptures and come up with our own understanding of it. And people hold on to it and say, listen, I this it mean. And I so me think and I this I it mean to me. And to me, that's kind of dangerous because Many persons, they have their own perception of God and you, you, you can't even get through to them because they're so, they're so bent on their perception of God. You know, 
some persons, they see God as a God. They don't know him as a father. They just see God as a God of judgment and wrath. And if you do something wrong, God is out to get you. And he's going to punch you. and going to kill you and murder you. And persons see God like that, unfortunately. And that is their perception of God. And so to get to somebody like that, because, you know, we're not under grace. And God is, even though he's a God of wrath, we know that. But he's also a God of grace. He's also a God of grace and mercy and love. He's very tender, very kind, very patient. So... Whatever perception of God you have in your mind, that's the God you're serving, unfortunately. And so we have to make sure that our perception of God is consistent with the God of the Bible. So even that, that too, that's one of the things I had to go through of unlearning my perception of God, or how God was, was introduced to me and get to know him for myself, making sure that, and this should also answer the question of persons who don't know how to hear the voice of God. They might hear a voice and the voice say, all right, go and throw your clothes into the river. Does that sound like God? So some so, so persons who don't know the voice of God and you're hearing a voice, it's always important whenever you hear that voice and whatever that voice is telling you to do, does it cons does this voice, is what this voice, is what this, what am I saying? The voice that I'm hearing and what it's telling me to do, does it, does, is it consistent with the God of the Bible? So that's one way to know whether or not the voice you're hearing is, is, is God or if it's, the enemy just playing tricks on your mind, right? So let's Trishana, would you believe we're out of time and I'm enjoying myself? You're gonna have to <laughs> the hour went. <laughs> wow. You're gonna have to come back. Now, seriously, did you say those were your nails? Those are all your nails? Yes. Because yes. I was looking at it and I said, Trishana, yes. I bought French nails. That's your real nail? <laughs> all of it, yes. <laughs> oh my God, they look nice. I was saying, Trishana, Trishana you. put on French nail, but that's your own nails. But what you're saying is so true, not just about psychosomatic disease, but when you suffer any trauma and you don't have an outlet for that trauma, the yes. trauma stays in your body and become cancerous and yes. upset it over it will kill you. It's yes. gonna kill you. You're gonna have cardiovascular disease, you're gonna have the, the panic attack and all those things. You're gonna have high blood pressure because you're too tense and yes. you work up all the time. It's gonna kill you. The secret you're keeping and holding in, it's not gonna be a secret when you're dead because everybody's gonna you're gonna be dead. Wow. And and we would live such better lives as Christian if, 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 if we would just allow God to work through us. Because what you were saying when you're questioning things, you are supposed to question things. Yeah. The Bible says we were made a little bit lower than Elohim. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm in church all my life, you can go and preach all you want and say what all you want. If that's what, what you're saying, not in the Bible, I don't even receive it. I don't even know. Ask me, did you hear what they say? I said, no, I just reject it. I didn't even pay any attention to it. So don't ask me about it after I come outside. I just knocked that out of my mind. It never even settled there because you're supposed to. Anybody tell you anything, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Nice. So you have to make sure what you're doing. So when you're questioning things is a part of growth because I would die for this. And when I tell God, cause I was a Trinitarian, I said, God, if I'm going to die for anything, I must understand it. I cannot mm -hmm. baptize because somebody showed me in the Bible. I said, I have to get it good because anything I believe in, you have to kill me to get me to not to believe what I believe in. And I cannot die for somebody else's conviction. I need my own conviction and my own encounter. You right. said so many true things. Everybody need their own encounter with God. Everybody yes. need that moment with God when this is how God revealed himself to me. And this is what changed me. So what Melissa was talking, why are you in church? Why are you serving God? Why do you sing? Why do you right. pray? Why are you doing anything? Seriously, can you answer the question? Why? Oh, oh well, I was told to do it. No, but why are you doing it and right. until we get to that why you will never develop a relationship with god because right. that's what you're saying you need a relationship with god that that you not just read the bible but the bible must read you and you right. must sit down right here and tell me what this means and let god 
talk to you through the words of the Bible. And that's how you grow. Not right. when you accept everything everybody tell you is when you ask them, okay, because I've heard people put and um, preach some foolishness. And like I by the time I get outside, Sister Monica, you hear what was said? I said, no. <laughs> I, I said, I don't even accept. I tell you, I knock them. I said, God, I'm not even going to let it get in my spirit because I have several scripture can back you up to tell you that's not right what you just said. I, I'm not receiving it. You must know your Bible for yourself because yes. in the last days, they're going to say, here is Christ. There is Christ. I'm not going nowhere. Right. If, if God is in Orlando, let him stay there. And if he's down in the keys, let him stay there. But don't tell yeah. me to go there to look for him. I'm not going. And people won't trick you or fool you or deceive you. You're going to have to come back to finish this because I know people have questions to ask because we all need deliverance in, in, in certain areas because I, I suffered with rejection. And so when I got saved, I worked myself to one point. The doctor told me, you better go get some rest or you're going to have a nervous breakdown. Oh. I was just doing everything because I went to give blood for somebody that was sick. He said, you don't even have blood in you to give. He said, you don't have any blood to give. He said, you wow. better go. I had to go take two weeks vacation and just eat, sleep, eat, sleep for two weeks because I started to feel my skin, things crawling on my skin because I was just going above and beyond trying to make God love me because you feel you suffer with rejection yeah. and you want your father to accept you by fasting and praying and just working 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 and doing everything that needs to be done because you want god to say hey look at monica she's doing good look right. at you because because you're looking for that acceptance yes the works that you do and then you work yourself to a frizzle and not, not even so much enjoying what you're doing but it's a duty you think you have to do it in order to be accepted by God. Because if you don't do it, you think that God may not love you like he loved the others who are not doing it. Mm -hmm. But if God can compare and say, they're not doing as good as, as she did, then maybe God will love you more yeah. than And so we all have our struggles and our difficulties. But the good thing is when you can self-awareness, when you can recognize where you are and say, God, change me. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. that's where, and that's what you're doing. You're saying, God, I see these things in me, so so change me. And that's it. I tell I, I can deal with anybody who is a liar and know they're a liar and ask God, it is the hypocrites I can deal with because you don't even know who you are. You don't know who you are because you're on you're straddling the fence. So you're going to have to come back and finish. So stick up in right there. And okay. whenever I have a slot, May is finished because we have May for women. But when we're doing June and July and anybody cannot make it, you're going to have to come back and finish because this is powerful. And I'm just going to pray, pray for you that you're, you're going to get over on the other side. Yes. But when you get over the other side, you're going to be better than when you started on this journey because everybody need to do what you're doing, knowing God for themselves and to be self-aware and say why am i biting my nails why do i do this why do i sing why do i pray when the thought comes in our our head just crush it like how you crush a cockroach all right because you cannot stop the pigeon from flying over you but don't let him build a nest yeah start to hatch chickens and then you say it's god tell you it was no god you never just bring that thought and take it captive amen so people were saying that you're speaking to them and they have gone through somebody said so true i never understood a lot of what i was going through so you have bring enlightenment you have educated and empowered a number of people here today and they're saying it in the chat that what you're saying resonates in their spirit because they have been there and that's what we're here to to and educate and empower others. And you have done an excellent, excellent job today. So you're going to have to come back and finish this. So I'll be in contact with you. Amen. We're over the time. It's now nine minutes after. <laughs> it's nine minutes after the hour went by so quick. When you do, when you love what you're doing and it's coming from your heart, you're not even noticing yes. that the time is going by because one, uh, one hour, what can I say in one hour? Just talk, open your mouth 
and God will fill it. So everybody, Tishana is one of our praise and worship leader at Emmanuel, and she can pray. She loves God, and it shows with how she worship and how she prays and God using her, and God is going to take her places. Know that name because one day you're going to hear that name, Trishana McGee. God bless you. Join us again on Thursday. We're going to have... Um, um, Eleanor uh, Williams, and she's from the Bahamas. She's a pastor's daughter, and she's now married to a pastor, and she's going to talk to us about being, um, oh, now Keisha is here, <laughs> being the pastor's wife and being the minister's wife. How do you contact, conduct yourself? How do you, somebody, oh, yeah, you are doing great. Yes, Trishana is doing great. How do you conduct yourself? If you become the wife of an evangelist, uh, a, a deacon, or of some, a pastor wife, how do you navigate those roles? Because those roles comes with responsibility, and she's going to just educate it on both sides of the fence. Seeing her mother doing it, and when she came a pastor wife, how she had to navigate being a pastor's wife. Amen. So even if you're not a pastor's wife, we, we learn here. We, we get knowledge. Like she said, Proverbs 11 verse nine, by wisdom, what that scripture go again, Trisha, and I'm going to study that scripture by wisdom. Is, knowledge shall it just be delivered. By knowledge shall it just be delivered. And one other thing I do, and I'm just going to, the last thing before I, I read uh, a chapter of Proverbs every day. Most months have 30 or 31 days and proverb have 31 chapter. So I read a proverb every day. Today is the 23rd. I read Proverbs 23. Because when I read it like that, every day somebody wants to be in contact. Oh, Keisha, you know how to get in contact with her. <laughs> when you read the scriptures like that every day, it drop in your spirit. So when I teach, I can pull from different things because I read a chapter of Proverbs every day because I want to be as wise as Solomon. And I'm reading it and I'm reading it and it's being recorded in my brain. Every month I just start over. So when May finish, I just start over in June. I have my regular scriptures I read. I'm in the New Testament, but I also read a Proverbs every day day because I want wisdom. And when you ask God for it, wisdom is the principal thing. So let us be wise. God bless you all. Join us on Thursday and bear up. Remember when you're praying, pray for Shoshana. And if you want her to speak, amen. I'll, I'll be more than happy if she agree. Remember on this Saturday, I'm, I'm Pastor Moulton was in Emmanuel last night. And I hear that she tear up the place. People were healed. People were delivered. And people were set free. And on Saturday, I'm still tired. Seriously, I'm still tired. But we had a, a time on Saturday. I was on my feet for over eight hours. On my feet. But I was intelligent enough. I said, I'm not going to put on my six inches. I put on a four inch. Next time I will stand up in four inches for over eight hours. Because when I was going home, I was walking like this, like a robot. Because I stood for all that time. But God is good. I hate low heel shoes. But anyway, God is good. But New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, Pennsylvania, all Maryland and all those places, all road lead to Brooklyn, New York at Pastor Devon Dawson's church. I don't remember the name of it, but for Pastor Devon Tabernacle Church of God. Amen. Grace deliverance and it says grace deliverance. So tell a friend, tell your neighbor, go to be healed, go to be delivered and go to be set free in Jesus name. God bless you all. See you on Thursday. God's willing. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Trishana. That was impactful. And I'm going to memorize that Proverbs 11, verse 9. I love it. I'm going to memorize it so it can be